Good afternoon and welcome to Carlam Cymru Revision Sessions. This session will focus on history GCSE and will be presented by Mr Geraint Penny. The sessions will last about 45 minutes where the teacher will go through the relevant subject content. If you have any questions, please use the question and answer section and we will endeavour to answer your question during the session. The sessions will be recorded with a recording and any relevant resources uploaded to the ISCOL website in the Carlam Cymru area. Thank you. Everybody, just to confirm, this is the third of four GCC history sessions. As you can see from the first slide, I will mostly be dealing with um, Unit 2 and the vast majority of it will be Germany module with one question on the United States. I will start with source questions and then move over to some more content elements and we'll see how far we get with regards to Germany content. Just to the quick scan of the first slide, I'll give you a quick little highlights of a few of the topics. For example, the middle slide, middle image shows the uh, Nuremberg rallies, the mass rallies where Hitler is apparently adored by thousands of people in the crowd. I've also shown an image of the, the more darker aspects of the Third Reich. This is an image of the attack on the Jews in the 1938 Reich Kristallnacht, Night of Broken Glass. And the right hand side has an image of a Nazi propaganda um, poster trying to win support during the um, elections, during the Great Depression. That's a nice little start to things, but I now wish to move towards source analysis skills. As you know, in the exam paper for Germany and America, there are five questions. And the first question is always a source and knowledge question. So I begin by showing you a source from the rise of the Nazis topic. And if you look closely, it asks you for two things. Use the source and use your knowledge to describe Nazi propaganda during this era. First thing I would look at the annotation below the photograph, below the poster even. The annotation tells you quite a lot. Hitler youth propaganda, so there's two aspects to cling on to already. Then below that, you can, sorry, above that, you can see some of the central images of Hitler's propaganda posters. So we just take a few seconds to quickly spot a number of things in the source. Before we look even closer, a quick reminder, what do we not discuss in our answers? But clearly for question one, it's asking source and knowledge. There's no reference, no need at all, for anything regarding audience of the source, tone of the source, reliability, usefulness, bias, exaggeration. It is only asking you, what does the source tell you and what do we know? So let's begin by looking at the source question, the source itself. A closer examination points out a number of things. The annotation, for example, clearly illustrates there is a, a poster trying to promote the Hitler Youth to the youngsters of Germany. It also illustrates the seemingly perfect racial profile, which every youngster should apply to eventually, as in fair hair and blue eyes, as in what we would know as the Aryan race or the Aryan look. You can clearly see the Hitler Youth is seen here as being the future of Germany. And then alongside the natural leader, as in Adolf Hitler here. So perhaps the, the propaganda shows this, Hitler's leadership, but also the youngsters. And you'll see that both the youngster and the leader are both looking to the future, as in a more positive future with Hitler in control and with the Hitler Youth of such um, dominant nature in society during the 1930s onwards. It also shows per, um, persuasive posters being used and emphasising the personality of the Führer, Adolf Hitler. There's plenty you could extract from the source rather quickly. What else do we know from our knowledge? Well, propaganda, as we know, emphasises ideology and themes such as war, conquest, enemies of the state. It is used heavily to influence voters at this time and to raise awareness of Hitler's promises. It also reinforces stereotypes, of course, 
for example, Aryan stereotypes. And its purpose is to, as I bolded here, to brainwash, to indoctrinate, to win people over to the Nazi way of thinking. Of course, to encourage participation in schemes such as the Hitler Youth and, of course, strength through joy. So plenty you could extract there from both the source and your knowledge and support. So that was a typical question one. So a few extracts from the source and a few more details from your knowledge. Next question is always an eight marker. Describe something. In this case, I've chosen to describe the appeal of Hitler to many German people. Not all German people supported Hitler, I'll grant you that, but a considerable number supported him, whether that was to do with fear or adoration of the Führer. My thoughts are, the point you know the best, go nice and early in the answer. For example, I've listed you the role of Hitler himself, the charisma factor, the personality, the fact that he organised a party. He was a war hero during WW1. His keen nature of delivering speeches, his real strength lay there. His organisation, um, his ideas like Lebensraum, as in living space, the Führer idea, anti-communist thoughts. So maybe that's your first paragraph. Then you could talk about other themes, such as he strengthens the party post Munich Putsch, following his period of incarceration at Landsberg Prison. Use of persuasive propaganda could heighten the appeal of Hitler. And of course, use of force, the stick. Use of intimidation of voters and other party members. Is it because some saw him as the lesser of two evils? He was anti-communist and communism was seen as a real active threat to post World War I Germany. Is it to do with the failure of the Republic itself? For example, coalition governments, where you had two or three or even more parties sharing government. Is it to do with the failure of Article 48? And of course, the legacy of the Treaty of Versailles and its impact on Germany, for example, loss of land, loss of territories, loss of armed force numbers, and the uh, inability to form an Anschluss with Austria. So yet again, plenty to include here on a typical eight mark question. And the eight mark, as with other questions, could focus on any topic from the seven Germany key issues. Question three. It's a purpose question. What is the purpose of this source? If we just pause for a second and look at the poster. We might get a few ideas straight away as to why this poster was created. If you look closely at the content, there's a number of clues. The main reason is to publicize, promote the use of the KDF cars. It also implies travel and opportunity and experiences abroad. Then you look at the annotation below. It's a promotion poster for the Strength Through Joy, which is what we know as a uh, leisure organization. Strength Through Joy, or as abbreviated, the KDF. In terms of marks, there are eight marks available for a question, four marks available for use of the source, and four marks for the discussion of your own knowledge. So why was this poster created? Now look at the bottom of the page. I would definitely mention the annotation, but I'd look at the number of things. Purpose, the rationale behind it, the reasons for the source being created, the origins of the source, who, when, why, and the background of the, the uh, author, or the artist in this case, the nature of the source, what type of source it is, the tone of the source, the audience, who's it aimed at? And my personal favourite, Jeep. Justify, educate, entertain and persuade. For most sources, I would say that for those four letters, at least two, if not three or four, will apply to each source. Let's have a quick look at what we can spot. My thoughts are, top of the page, purpose. 
It's there to su get, generate support for the KDF, the organization, to raise the profile of strength through joy, get more publicity for the scheme. It's a form of propaganda, of course, to celebrate the benefits of being a part of the Nazi community, create an excitement for the initiative, to give the positives of the KDF, a chance to see great scenes, to purchase a car on higher purchase, of course. It's an accessible method via saving stamps. It's an exciting opportunity. And that is shown in the tone, isn't it? It's very positive, exaggerating, beautiful scenery kind of tone to the source. Is it there to educate? So I'm now thinking of Jeep. Is it there to educate you on the merits of the KDF scheme or educate German people in the 30s? To tell people of the glories of owning a car on a rather cheap deal? Is it to persuade you of the benefits of it? And the benefits of being a Nazi or the benefits of being a part of the Nazi community here? So who is it aimed at? The audience. Is it aimed at the traditional party members? Is it aimed at new members or people who could be swayed to join the party so that they do not focus on the negatives, they focus on the positives of the regime in this people's community in the 1930s? So if you notice, we moved away from purpose. We looked at purpose, audience, tone of the source. And all this then stemmed back to why it's been created. So that was from the source alone. But now we add in a little extra from our knowledge. We've seen a few on this slide, but now what else can we include? Maybe it's to raise awareness. It's to show people of the benefits of loyalty to Hitler. Implied promotion to encourage a great level of support for this community, to create community spirit, of course, to create a positivity during the Hitler years. Maybe you could talk about other aspects to do with the KDF, like the labour front, which improved working conditions, adult classes, ski trips, subsidised holidays, theatre visits. There's more to it than this in this umbrella movement, isn't there? Maybe there's a clear motive here to indoctrinate the people as a form of control, perhaps. To remove the potential for opposing groups who might um, be against Hitler's ideologies. It doesn't actually discuss the negatives, so maybe it's there to hide over, say to gloss over the negatives of the, uh, the car saving scheme and the negatives of the regime. So as I mentioned, four marks source, four marks for the use of the, the actual knowledge. What I would not start off with is the source is useful in that it. There you're going to become irrelevant. You start with perhaps the statement, the use, the purpose of the source is to. The rationale of the source is to. The reason behind this source material is to publicize. So that was question three. Question three. The purpose question, traditionally seen as one of the more challenging questions. But as you can sense, there's plenty available in the source itself. Plenty of hints in within the actual content of the source. And of course, the little hints in the annotation, which I'm sure we would use extensively. So that is question three, a purpose question worth eight marks. So now I wish to look towards a USA question. Question four, which of the sources is more useful to an historian studying something? So question four, you would not know what topic will arrive of these seven key questions, but it will be a 12 marker and it will be two sources to look at. Now what I've done, first of all, I've highlighted a few things. Notice that aspect, which is more useful. I've, I've highlighted the monkey trial. There's no point in us discussing what the sources tell us and how useful they are if we do not discuss what the sources are about. So clearly, context is vital here. I've picked out a few little interesting points in the annotation as well. So before we start looking at the source, let's be aware of the annotation. Let's be aware of the origin. But clearly, a source written by Billy Sunday 
who is a fundamentalist and a revivalist, who will be on the side of religion in the religion versus science debate in the monkey trial. Whereas the second source you'd like to think will be more neutral is from a newspaper reporting on the ongoing trial. So maybe we already have a window into the question by looking at the annotation alone. How do we start the question? Hopefully not with a statement, the source tells me that. We start with a statement, the source A has a good number of uses, source A is relatively useful in that it, source A has a certain level of value in that it. Some students like to do source A first, then source B, and then a quick conclusion at the end with some comparison of the two. So we're going to start by looking at a number of things. You might be tempted to discuss a number of themes here. Content is vital, but in your own words, clearly. Paraphrasing two sources will not score you very highly. Clearly, you need to include more contextual support from your mind. Why is the source being created? Does that make A less reliable, less useful than B? perhaps. The authorship, who they are, who the author is, when, who, why. Is it fact or is it opinion? Is it opinionated source? Is it accurate? Is it falsified? Is it exaggerating? What type of source is it? What's the tone like? And who is it aimed at in the audience? So there are a few little things there we could consider. The point I'm making is if we focus on content alone, we will run out of ideas quite quickly. So we need an effective marriage between content and authorship to arrive at a good answer for this source. First of all, let's look at the content of these two sources. Content. I've underlined a few things or bolded a few things for you. Let him, but do not expect the Christian people, the country to pay the teacher of a rotten, stinking professor. Teaches our children to forsake God, God forsaken dirty politics. The content is quite clearly is rather opinionated, rather forceful in its nature. So what does the content tell us? Well, I've picked out source A in particular here. I've said at the bottom it's useful as it illustrates the level of anger created by the teaching of evolution in the Johnny Scopes trial, of course. Johnny Scopes was the teacher, if you didn't know that already. Demonstrates the divisions between religion and science, between evolution and creation, of course. Doesn't it demonstrate the level of anger in the southern states? In this case, the um, Deep South, or what you might think of the Bible Belt. So I picked up a few little things that I could you could expand on to say what the source tells you. To try to contextualize the content of the source. So perhaps the first few sentences would be what the source tells you, but clearly in your own words. But then you'd wish to address issues such as tone of the source, audience of the source. So now look at the issues such as audience. Look at the authorship here. It's a sermon delivered by a fundamentalist preacher who will clearly have an issue here with the teaching of evolution, and will clearly have not clearly we're not have an impartial viewpoint here. Now I'm always a little bit cynical of the use of bias. Too many students just say it's bias, it's not useful, and it becomes a real throwaway skimming kind of comment. So what can we say here? Look at what I've circled here or bolded here. Maybe the utility of the source can be questioned as it perhaps has a motive to create support for the fundamentalist cause. And the provenance of the source underlines the fact the author is not an impartial writer here. However, perhaps B demonstrates a more neutral and balanced perspective, and the motive is to enlighten the readers about such an event. However, I do have a little bit of doubt. The tone in B does not totally sound neutral, does it? OK, it sounds more than a, a reporting kind of tone to it. Think of the audience of the source. Source A could be aimed at um, members of the church who are critical of the idea of evolution. 
Maybe it's aimed at people who they're trying to win over to the church's way of thinking or the fundamentalist church's way of thinking regarding the idea of creation over evolution. So I picked out a number of points there which, which shows some kind of comparison between A and B. I also looked at some of the vocab used with regards to tone of the source. Well, clearly the red comments here implies a negativity regarding the monkey trial. Maybe source A is overly emotional. Maybe source A is not detached from the event. Perhaps B is more detached, whereas A is more personally involved. Maybe the writer feels personally affected by the issue at stake here. But then again, look at source B. You sense at times the tone of the source is a little bit patronizing. Searching words, for example, stumped him. He took refuge in his faith. There's a slightly personal tone to the source, maybe. But in essence, more neutral than source A, which you might take into account when you're discussing which is more useful, which has more value to an historian studying the monkey trial. If you notice, we've looked at tone, audience, nature of the source, authorship and content of the source, but also try to marry it with references to our own knowledge. Then we score well on the source evaluation, but also score well from our knowledge. If memory serves me correctly, half the marks are earned from factual content. And then I suggest a brief two sentences conclusion, but please emphasize which you think is more useful. You might stress that both have some use or relative amount of use, but try to direct towards one side of the argument, as in which is the more useful if you could. Okay, so that is a quick search through the four types of source questions. Now I was hoping to spend a little bit of time returning to the factual content. I looked at key questions three and four from the Germany topic last week. So now I want to do a few more key questions today for the remaining part of the lesson. So I'm going to focus on key question five, first of all. Let me just pause for a minute and see what little hints we can see in this slide. The middle image shows an advert for the KDF, as we know is Strength Through Joy, a leisure program. Clearly it's a form of uh, propaganda promotion piece. On the left, you can see the impact of a Nazified youth. To Nazify means to bring them over to the Nazi way of thinking. On the left, you can see Hitler Youth members embracing the moment where they meet the Führer, Adolf Hitler. Notice how many of the people are fair looking to enforce the stereotype of the Nazi Aryan look. Bottom right, she's that image from the Reich Kristallnacht as in the Night of Broken Glass, 1938, November 1938. And the top right is an image of a Nazified church members. So let's look a little deeper here. First of all, how does the Nazis treat young people? There's two elements here. One, I would discuss education and schools. Notice the key word, indoctrination brainwashing, indoctrinate youngsters to turn them into loyal Nazis by controlling education. How do they do this? For example, teachers had to belong to the Nazi Teachers League. Lessons were taught to Nazify, to promote Nazi ideals. Textbooks were, were rewritten or censored or rewritten to help brainwash, to reflect the Nazi views at this time. Nazi ideologies like Lebensraum, the Führer principle, anti-Semitism, anti-communism, the impact of war and conquest. The curriculum for males, as you can see in the photograph, was mostly to enforce aspects of the military, but also anti-Semitism, as shown in the left-hand side. 
So you have two young uh, German Jewish males being pushed to the front of the class and exposed for what they are in Nazi stereotypes and to expose them as being different from the Aryan males. The real chilling example, isn't it, of the cruelty shown towards minority groups this time. You can also see in the right side indoctrination, people doing the Sieg Heil, doing a school environment to show a Nazified education. The bottom line of the page, for females, they were taught to be good homemakers and mothers, domestic lives. Can I point out quickly, by the way, the materials I have for these three key issues today are taken from the knowledge organisers in the WJC website. I really recommend those. Very useful. I just added a few images to them to give them more contextual support. Second part, how you indoctrinate the youth, was of course the Hitler Youth Movement. The law made it difficult to avoid joining by allowing pressure to be put on parents. Not everybody joined the Hitler Youth, but the second law, 39, made it compulsory. So difficult not to join the Hitler Youth. Seven million members by 1939. That's out of 16 million, of course, youngsters. Notice how clever the use of propaganda this year on the left side. Notice how well choreographed this photograph is and how the, the more promising people at the front, because the blonde hair and blue eyes, and in contrast, an image of the female Hitler Youth, the BDM, which here implies the importance of motherhood and caring to be caring mothers to, of course, raise the birth rate in the Third Reich. That was the one aspect of how they controlled people's lives or changed society. Second aspect, of course, is policies towards religion. This is done to weaken the hold that the Catholic and Protestant churches had on the people. For example, the German faith movement was encouraged by the Nazis to replace Christian values with pagan non-Christian ideas. For example, Mein Kampf was replaced by, sorry, Mein Kampf replaced the Bible in some churches. What we have at the bottom of the page is a reference to the pro-Nazi Reich Church. This is a Nazified church. Some opposed, like the brave individual, Pastor Namola, Martin Namola, with a photograph is shown on the left side of that slide. He was incarcerated at Sachsenhausen concentration camp outside of Berlin. And you can still view his cell if you visit the camp. The right side, of course, shows the fact that bishops had to be Nazified. Those who did not Nazify or become Nazified could be imprisoned or incarcerated in concentration camp. And of course, it mentions the Catholic Church and their agreement, what we call the Concordat with the Pope. The agreement was the Church and Nazism would leave each other alone. The Catholic Church would stay out of domestic politics in Nazi Germany. And move forward to look at examples of how they rebuild the Nazi, sorry, Nazi German economy. Is it an economic miracle? Six million unemployed to less than half a million by 39. Is it a miracle? Or is it to do with dubious aspects like invisible unemployment? If women were sacked from jobs or sacked from high paying jobs or encouraged to leave, they do not count as unemployed, nor did unemployed Jews or Jews who've been removed from high paying jobs or certain professions, which we'll come back to later. The RAD is mentioned here. There's a photograph of RAD on the left side. Compulsory for all males at that young age to serve in the RAD for six months to, of course, get unemployed people off the stats and have them working for society, building issues like building autobahns, motorways, hospitals, schools and houses, as well as planting trees. And, of course, rearmament to completely diminish the power of the Treaty of Versailles in terms of the disarmament process of the Treaty of Versailles. Well, Hitler denies this. He goes back on this and starts to remilitarize 
German uh, armed forces. He also introduced the four-year plan and heavy rearmament and introduced autarky to make Germany self-sufficient in what it needs. How does life change through this economic so-called miracle? Unions were replaced by the German Labour Front, for example, to discipline workers, regulating pay and hours of work. You were unable to strike, for example, and the obvious result of a strike would be incarceration in a camp like Dachau or Sachsenhausen. There were other aspects of life for workers, of course. Strength through joy was aimed to improve leisure time. I put three examples there of propaganda pieces. The first being a photograph, and the second and third being propaganda posters, trying to spread, spread the importance of the KDF methods, like leisure facilities, spot subsidized leisure activities, cultural events, beauty work, for example, was set up to improve working conditions. As happy workers become good workers, good workers become more loyal to the regime, people who are less likely to question the regime when they hear about negative excesses of the regime. And of course, the people's car scheme, the VW car, where you could save up for your own car through the 1930s. Next, we will look at the role of women during the 1930s. Hitler believed women should follow the three Ks, for example, which means in English, children, church and kitchen give up their jobs to marry and start a family. So they should have a domestic life as seen in the female Hitler Youth Movement. An interesting one was the law for the encouragement of marriages. A new couple would be given a loan, but then they would not pay it back if they had four children. If you have one child, one fourth of the loan is paid back. If you have four children, it is all paid back. Even more intriguing is what we call the Lebensborn program, Life Springs or Spring of Life. Unmarried Aryan women were encouraged to go along to the Lebensborn and be supported and become pregnant by a racially pure SS gentleman. Who, of course, raised the birth rates of the Third Reich. We have a mixed picture because, of course, it was about indoctrination. Many women were forced out of jobs, for example. Contraception was discouraged. So were um, marital aspects, for example, the ability to divorce. Another example is the Motherhood Cross, a medal given to reward women for their service to the Reich, for having a number of children. And you can see a photograph here of the three medals on display. The gold was given for the ultimate glory of having eight children for the Third Reich. Notice the pride on the image in this photograph here on the left. Of course, we need to look at the negatives even further. How Jews and minority groups like gypsies, for example, and homosexuals were mistreated during the Third Reich years. We know that Hitler believed in the idea of a master race, the Aryan master race. We had this year of sterilization of those who were mentally ill, disabled, homosexuals, for example. We hear of Hitler promoting anti-Semitism to blame the Jews for Germany's recent problems, like the loss of World War I, hyperinflation in 1923, and the Great Depression of 1929 to 1933. I've enclosed some examples here of Nazi, real brutal and negative and shocking propaganda here, trying to enforce stereotypes on German people with regards to the German Jew. Worse was yet to come, of course. 33 to 39, we see an unbelievable amount of hardships faced. The top left photograph shows the boycotting of Jewish shops where you try to um, influence people to not shop in a Jewish shop. You do this by force and intimidation. The SA guards outside, seen even more, obviously, in the second photograph. They're also banned from doing important jobs like teaching or working in the civil service 
or becoming doctors. So well-paid professions like doctors, for example, were now offered to Aryan males, not German Jews. And of course, the infamous Nuremberg Laws, which removed citizenship from the Jews, made illegal to them to have a relationship with Aryans. Which was yet to come, of course, 1938, Goebbels organised attacks on Jewish property across Germany. The stats are alarming, aren't they? Over two days, an alarming amount of bloodshed and heartache. I think the the middle photograph speaks volumes, doesn't it? About the horrors of anti-Semitism. And on, on the right, you see the remains of a synagogue. On the left, the personal cost of individuals trying to repair the events for, as a result of the events in the previous night. And of course, Jews were fined one billion Reich marks for the damage, the damage caused by the Nazi regime, of course. That is called the Kristallnacht, Night of Broken Glass in November 1938. Furthermore, I'm now going to look at number six for a few minutes. Number six, the methods used by the Nazi regime to control Germany and German people. I think these photographs speak volume. Volumes about the Third Reich, the first image, Nazi propaganda poster, and of course, the clever tactic tactician called Josef Goebbels in terms of propaganda, and of course the use of the, the stick, the police state, you know, the SS in front of Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, and of course the, the gates to a concentration camp. I do believe that is Dachau outside of Munich. What we call a card and a stick, scaring people into doing they're told, but also convincing them they're doing the right thing, the carrot and the stick. And look at Goebbels' quote here. Propaganda penetrates the whole of life without the public having any knowledge of it. He believed that people were not that clever in Germany and they were able to um, infiltrate their minds via propaganda, but cleverly using propaganda and images and stereotypes to, of course, indoctrinate and brainwash. Some examples then of the police state, the SD set up to discover actual and potential enemies of the Nazi party and of course remove them. And on the right you have an image of Sachsenhausen concentration camp. I do believe that was taken after Kristallnacht in 1938. And the SS of course, Hitler's bodyguards, a ruthless and vicious organization responsible for the removal of all opposers to the Nazis within Germany. And they ran, of course, the concentration camp. The SS officers had to be pure Aryans, as you'd expect. Of course, we have the Gestapo, the police force, who could arrest and imprison suspected enemies of the state without trial, using surveillance and informants to catch their victims. Often people were arrested at night to enforce and spread the idea of fear. We often use the phrase, speak through a flower, as in say positive things in Nazi Germany, because there's a threat of being arrested. Opponents ended up in camps, including Jehovah's Witnesses, Jews, members of the rival parties, for example. 660,000 people were in these camps by 39 before the war began. And of course, their mistreatment intensifies beyond belief during World War II itself. How about propaganda? The Ministry for Proper Entertainment, sorry, Enlightenment and Propaganda was set up by Goebbels to control the thoughts and beliefs and opinions of the people. Film reels had pro-Nazi storylines, for example, The Eternal Jew, approved by Goebbels. News reels focused on achievement was shown with every film in the cinema. Like Triumph of the Will was a famous Nazi propaganda piece by famous director Lenny Riefenstahl. Rallies, of course, were organised. A major stirring spectacle with speeches by Hitler created an atmosphere of frenzy and excitement and, of course, adoration for the Fuhrer. Radio stations were under control, of course, given only Nazi messages. 
Posters were seen everywhere with Nazi messages, of course. Ein Reich, Ein Volk, Ein Führer. The Olympics were the major showpiece for the regime. They hosted this to publicize Nazi ideals and success around the world. And they were meant to prove Aryan superiority. Quite interesting, they did win more medals than any other country at the Games. And a much higher no number than America's numbers. But of course, they, uh, they do have the infamous moment where American black athlete Jesse Owens wins gold, which would have horrified many uh, supporters of the regime. If you look at the middle picture, you can see, can't you, the impact of propaganda here. Sure. Propaganda and indoctrination, of course. They also control the legal system. Lawyers had to belong to the National Socialist League, maintenance of law and order, and sacked if they refused. People's court was set up to try enemies of the state. Over 500 people were put to death by 39. Famous judge was Judge Freisler, a rabidly Nazified judge at this point. Right to trial before prison was, of course, abolished. Numbers of people sentenced to death were alarmingly high, as you can see. 46 crimes punishable by death in 1943, e.g. for listening to a foreign radio station. Censorship was also used. Actors, writers had to join the Reich Chamber of Culture, for example. To challenge this idea, you were classed as degenerate. Newspapers had strict censorship laws. Nazis closed down thousands of newspapers and you were told what to print. And then, of course, there's the infamous burning of the books. To put across the Nazi message and to remove certain books which were seen as anti-Nazi. This brutal image is shown on the right hand side, of course. Dick, jazz in particular, was this, um, hated by the Führer. He preferred more classical music like Bach and Beethoven, Wagner, Wagner was his personal favourite. Theatre, cheap tickets encouraged people to see Nazi-inspired plays. The art, modern art was banned at this point. He preferred more heroic imagery that promotes Nazi ideals. And the last key question is, of course, the factors leading up to the outbreak of war. I'll just show you a few quick images before we finish at six o'clock. For example, I have outlined here the aims of foreign policy, like uniting all German speakers, destroy communism, and of course, get achieve in Lebensraum. And there are a few examples of Hitler rearming Germany. 1.4 million in the, arm, in the army itself in 39, producing tanks, aircraft, and ships, of course. A number of areas were taken over. Tsar in 35. The Rhineland in 36, where the troops marched into the Rhineland. The Anschluss in 1938 between Germany and, and uh, Austria. Of course, the marching into the Sudetenland in 1938, threatening to attack Czechoslovakia to protect Sudeten Germans. And of course, the Allies had to agree. It's what we call appeasement on the Allied side, appeasement. Hitler goes a step further invades Czechoslovakia in 1939, or the rest of Czechoslovakia in 1939. And of course, the trigger moment which caused World War II was the invasion of Poland. As you know, Britain was allied with Poland and guaranteed to protect her future and her borders. When Hitler invades Poland, UK then declares war on Nazi Germany. So I'd like to think we've covered an extensive amount in the last 45 minutes. So we've gone over four exam questions and the seven, oh, sorry, and four of the key issues. But of course, these resources will be placed on the website for you to use at your own time. Okay, thank you very much.